Uh, one after ten, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this final presentation of the Fall Wonders class. As many of you know, in recent years, we have offered ILR classes focusing on major composers, the periods of music history, the instruments of the orchestra, and jazz. I'm especially pleased that today you're going to learn about a new genre of music that developed in post-industrial America and now involves young people around the world. I'm referring to hip hop, and I want to just pause here and have Julie Ann, our technical wizard, come out to show you she's really in the spirit. See? <laughs> there you go. I know. I <laughs> To tell us about the Bronx origins of hip hop, we are fortunate to have with us today, Dr. David Canton, Director of African American Studies Program at the University of Florida. Dr. Canton graduated with a BA in history from Morehouse College, received his MA in black studies from the Ohio State University. I said that right, didn't I? You got it. <laughs> and, a, and a PhD in history from Temple University. Dr. Canton is the director of the African American Studies Program at the University of Florida. Before coming to UF in 2020, Dr. Canton was a professor and administrator at Connecticut College for about 17 years. Dr. Canton is the author of a prize-winning book entitled Raymond Pace Alexander, A New Negro Lawyer Fights for Civil Rights in Philadelphia. His articles and essays have appeared in numerous referee journals and other important publications. His recent article on the lack of American African American players in Major League Baseball appeared in US News and World Report. At UF, David teaches courses on the black freedom struggle, the history of hip hop music and culture, and introduction to African American studies, among others. His African American history class was featured on C-SPAN American History Television. Dr. Canson's presentation will last about one hour after which there will be time for Q&A. Please join me now in giving a very warm welcome to David Canton. Well, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank Don for this opportunity in the I I ILR program. I did some research online. It's a great program. Thank you for coming out this morning. And uh, before I get into it, let's just give a little background. I'm a big historian, all into context. And uh, in fact, uh, hip hop music and hip hop music will be 50 years old next August. August of 1973 is when this thing called hip hop culture is created in the Bronx. So it celebrates 50th anniversary next August. There's a museum that's being developed in the Bronx, the Universal Hip Hop Museum, which will open up in 2024. Hip hop is the number one downloaded music. But I know for many Americans, hip hop is nothing but some would say noise, right? Trash. It's not music right? It kills black people, right? And all the other things, and we'll get all into that today, have an honest discussion, but hip hop is also more complicated because I think when you talk about hip hop, there's commercial, which you on the radio, the commodification, then there's the art. And that's where you start to see the, the, the tension, right? There's artists out there that do talk about good messages, but that's why you don't hear them. They're not on the radio because it doesn't generate any what? Revenue, right? Then there's commercial artists that talks about things that generates revenue, sex, drugs, and violence, just like rock and roll, right? What, what becomes popular or entertaining are messages that are not the most uplifting. So when we talk about hip hop, it's, more, it's a more complicated discussion, right? And I think that's what I want to get out of today as we talk during the Q&A. So we'll go to the first slide. So the first book on hip hop was by Trisha Rose who in fact grew up, you see that slide there, in Corp City. She's at Brown University. So she wrote a dissertation on hip hop. The book is called Black Noise, came out in 1994. Now I was at Ohio State in grad school. So that's the first official scholarly book on hip hop music in 1994. So we have now hip hop studies. There's a journal called the Journal of Hip Hop Studies. If Harvard University, they have a host the hip hop archive. So this is legitimate scholarly area of expertise. Now, again, many people out there that, that can't be true, but they said the same thing about jazz in the twenties, that jazz music wasn't music, right? They called it music for jackasses. So the thing about it is anytime black people create stuff, 
there's always some sort of question. Is it real music? It's not symphony. It's not European classical. But nevertheless, we saw the same critiques of jazz. We saw the same thing in hip hop, but they share a lot in common. They both have urban origins, New Orleans, the Bronx, the city. So we look at early hip hop studies, there's different methods look at it. So there's the social structural materialist, right? So we talk about the Bronx in the 70s, right? Deindustrialization, the factory jobs. Remember those back in the day that moved this country after World War II? They had benefits, there was overtime in healthcare, what made America, America. Those jobs disappeared and went to what? Mexico and foreign countries because why? Not that they're better workers, it was cheaper wages. I mean, these are still conversations we're having today. We should have, okay? So when those jobs left, they devastated the Bronx, Detroit, Houston, Philadelphia, all other areas, Atlanta, where you have a hip hop scene, okay? Next, you have loss of jobs. So you had those good, stable jobs that did not require a college degree. Y'all remember those days, right? You just needed a high school degree at 18. You left mom and dad's house, got an apartment, got a car, and called it a day. Did your 35 years, got your pension, and you retired, and that was it. Okay? All that's starting to leave in the 50s and 60s, just when African Americans now move into the cities. Okay? So now you have a loss of jobs, poor housing, because we also know that public housing was a function of what? Federal government policies, right? During the New Deal, we have the housing policies that opened up the suburbs, which went disproportionately to whites. Where African Americans, Latino Americans were left with public housing, right? Older housing, public housing. Next, you have crime. Mid early 70s, Detroit, Atlanta, Philadelphia, serious crime issues. Okay, there's a movie called Fort Apache with Paul Newman. You can look it up on YouTube. That, and again, again, when the movies come out, they, of course, overemphasize, right? But nevertheless, I use them in my class to show the point, just like those old uh, Clint Eastwood movies. Remember in the 70s, Dirty Harry, crime in San Francisco, guns and crime. Crime sells in America, doesn't it? It's entertaining, right? We're all scared of crime, okay? And that's in the recent election we talk about crime today, right? Next, we have concentrated poverty, not just poverty, but concentrated. That means everybody's poor. So you have a loss of jobs, everybody's poor, all in one tight area is going to be a problem, right? So you look at urban poverty, it's concentrated poverty. If you look at rural poverty, it's more spread out, right? That makes a difference, okay? Then, of course, we're going to have a gang problem, right? Now, again, gangs, we go back to a movie called Gangs in New York. That's not, we saw in the 19th century, there were white gangs, there were Jewish gangs, there were Italian gangs, right? That human beings, we like to belong to something. And particularly for males, this gang culture becomes attractive to many young African-Americans in these urban areas. So there's a movie called The Warriors, comes out in 1979. I used that in my class. So again, Hollywood gets hold of these ideas puts them on film to show an issue. So it talked about gang issues in New York, all right? Next, we have the cultural aesthetic way. So what were the cultural aesthetics precursors to hip hop? So we have black radio DJs like Frankie Cocker on WBLS. The DJ, which becomes the center of hip hop, a lot of early hip hop DJs wanted to be like Frankie Cocker. Cool, mellow voice, the Quiet Storm, stuff of that nature. They stay, stay little rhymes on the mic, you know, different things like that that made them very popular. But you find that when hip hop started, because it was by young people, older black DJs hated hip hop. It's not music, it's trash, it's garbage. So a lot of early black music executives did not like hip hop music. Because remember now, these are kids 13, 14, 15, and 16 when this uh, art form takes off. If you're about 21, 22, 25, you're not part of that generation to some degree, okay? Then, of course, we have the 1960s, the Black Arts Movement. People like Nikki Giovanni, people like Sonia Sanchez, the dead, the dead poets, okay, where Black artists are creating their own Black aesthetic. Hip-hop creates their own Black aesthetic, right? Where we're no longer just fighting to what? Desegregate or assimilate, creating Black unique aesthetics that they're going to follow. So these are some of the backdrops to hip hop. 
So you see the images right there, that's the South Bronx, where landlords to collect insurance company money burn down buildings on purpose. We see Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter visiting the South Bronx in the late 70s, early 80s. Okay, that's why they call it Fort Apache, the 41st precinct in the Bronx. High crime rates. Now, but the other part is that becomes also a stereotype because in the next picture there, that's why I grew up in the Bronx in Corp City. But when we talk about the Bronx, we're talk about the other image because that's what sells. Where I grew up in Corp City, created in 1968, affordable housing. That's my high school there, the tall one in the bill. That's why I went to school from K through 12. Then across the street from me, there's a whole bunch of homeowners. But when you, oh, this a pointer? Oh, this is perfect. Right here, that's my high school, right? That's why I went to elementary school and middle school. So that's Corp City, still around. And in fact, my dad, who's turning 83 in January, is still in the same apartment 50 years later, okay, called Corp City. When we talk about the Bronx, we always talk about this image. I grew up here. I don't know anything about that. When you say from the Bronx, that's what you think. Then you think I'm part of a gang. My father wasn't around. All the stereotypes. I don't know anything about that. All the guys I grew up with who are still around active today, no jail time. We don't know anything about that. Okay, so that's the part you want to always be mindful of. When you talk about any area, right, it's more complicated than what movies point out. And here we have the Black Arts Book. Go to the next slide. All right, so in hip hop, on August 11th, 1973, on 1520 Sedgwick Avenue in the Bronx is when we have the first hip hop party. Why? We have, well, it should be four elements in hip hop, right? You have graffiti, artists, and again, I know that's a crime. I know it made the cities look horrible with the subways. I mean, obviously it stops now. No one does anymore. I think you find people do it like on canvases. That's Taki 183. In fact, he was a white guy. A lot of early graffiti started in Philadelphia. Okay. We have DJing right there. Then we have what they call, what y'all know is break dancing, B-boys and B-girls. Okay. So there's four elements. There's the MC, the person that raps, graffiti artists, DJs, B-boys and B-girls are all at this party in the Bronx on August 11, 1973. And that's what you call hip hop music. It was a party to raise money to buy school clothes. All right. Now, again, the average age of people probably like from 10, 11, 12, 13 to 16 years old. These are young people behind this movement in the Bronx, making something from nothing. Many parties are held in buildings. They would run the, the uh, cords out the light posts for power, being creative. Okay, we also see that graffiti becomes, a, here we make the New York Times, which means you're in trouble, right? That means, okay, this become a major issue. If you look at old 70s New York films, you look at the subways, full of graffiti. But for many of these artists, putting your name up, getting seen throughout the city, okay, was a big deal. The city would spend millions of cleaning up these trains. If you've been to New York, those, it's over, it doesn't happen anymore. I guess some would say, fortunately, the trains do look much better. But obviously, this was part of the culture that time period. We see the DJs here, very important. We'll get to some in a minute, where DJs create the mood and atmosphere for hip hop. Okay, and of course, the B-boys and B-girls. These are the folks that got on the floor. I don't, I'm retired, don't ask me to do it. Don't ask me to do it. I gotta go to work later. I'll be done for the week. I'll do pickleball. <laughs> I'll do that, I'm done, right? There goes the boom box. You had to buy like 15 to 20 D batteries back in the day, right? Okay, and obviously what also part of hip hop is clothing. The sneakers you wear, the hats, the shirts, which like a little name on it, the jeans. So hip hop creates its own aesthetic. That's for young people who can't get into the discos in Manhattan. Because remember, disco is number one music at this time. But that's the Manhattan scene. This is a Bronx, uptown, young person scene. In fact, I had a friend who went to school, went to Morehouse undergrad. Many HBCU students hated hip hop because they saw it as music for people from the ghetto, right? Because when you go to HBCUs, your job is what? Move up and become middle class. You don't want to be identified with this culture. Do the next slide. All right. 
So we also talk about, well, what is hip hop? What are the breaks? Okay. If you listen to like a James Brown record, right? There's a part where it's all instrumental. Okay. So in the Bronx, they created, they found this called the break. And what DJs do is they play the break over and over and over again. So you're taking the song, you're finding that part where it's all instrumental, you take that segment, and the key is to make it play over and over again. When the breaks come on, that's when the B-boys and the B-girls get on the floor and start break dancing or B-boying. Okay? And that's what made it uniquely a Bronx thing. Getting on this floor on what they call the break beat. And that's what these DJs do. How do I replay the break beat? So a lot of hip hop songs, they, it's like a song that's been made. You find that little segment in there. You play the segment over and over and you rap over that segment. That's what hip hop is. So many people say, well, that's not creative. But the time, well, what DJs do, they go out and search for records. They spend hours going in basements trying to find that perfect beat to make a hip hop song. So these are some real creative young people becoming experts and creating new music out of older music. And now one of the most famous DJs is Grandmaster Flash. He was a Grandmaster Flash in the Furious Five. You heard of them? Yes? Okay, there we go. Okay. See, we heard of him, right? I contend he should have won a, uh, ever heard of the MacArthur Genius Awards? Those things started in 1981. He should get one right now. Because what he was able to do was create this as, a, as an art form. He spent three years working on what he called the quick mix theory. So again, it's African Americans don't get the credit they deserve. He didn't do this in three days or three minutes. He practiced for three years. We just bury himself in his apartment in the Bronx and practicing this quick mix theory. We take a record, we take a crayon, and find the, the, the break beat and mark it on the record. Right? I still understand how he does it. I still don't get it. This is genius. There's no doubt about that. Okay? So that's what makes Grandmaster Flash, I'd argue, a MacArthur Genius winner. But this is 1981. The country wasn't, we didn't see the world that way back then. But nevertheless, he spent three years. Now, he was so good, he went to a party, and instead of people dancing, they were watching him DJing. And he was upset. I'm not here to, to be watched. I want you guys to dance. But what he was doing, the mixing and the scratching was just mind blowing. That's where he came up with the idea was, I need somebody who can rap to take the attention off me and put it on the MC. Because he was getting all the attention because he was a genius. There's no doubt about it. Okay. All right. I'm going to play one song for you. We can hit this song. After the, uh, and you can move it up some. You have to do what now? Oh, okay, no sweat. Yep. All right, so what you would do is take out, take out the lyrics, right? Take out the instrumental, and then that song will come out the break. So there's a book called The Foundation. There are like six songs. They're like the foundation of hip hop. Six songs, right? These are songs that if you go to the Bronx today and take them to these old, these folks, some about 60 years old now, 62, 63, old B boys. When you hear these six songs, they might come out of retirement and start moving, right? I'm not one of them. <laughs> I'm done, okay? So they found, so these are songs. And so again, a lot of early hip hop are 70s disco records. Not the whole records, just again, segments of them. 
many modern hip hop songs segment from jazz, uh, rock and roll, uh, uh, all types of music. So the argument is where's the creativity? The creativity is when you sit down and you see how the song is created. When you sit down and see where they find the, I'm talking about segments, three seconds, four seconds of any type of song and make a new song out of it. That's the brilliance of it. Okay, now of course later there's gonna be issues of sampling, right? Where a lot of rappers were taking songs and not giving other folks credit. Now a lot of that's because you find that a lot of these were songs that artists who weren't making any money but then once hip hop starts making money, then we start suing these artists, right? And that's what happened, right? There's a song by the Turtles. I think no one played it in years, but there's an artist by the name of Biz Markey who made an album. That's when you start having these sampling lawsuits because as hip hop starts making money, many artists, you know, they should get paid. So now you find that, you know, artists have to get clearance. You have to get permission or else you get sued. There's a song recently by uh, Pharrell Williams and, um, they took a Marvin Gaye loop and they got sued for about $14 million. So that's what the Marvin Gaye people, they just wait, to use their records. You want to make sure you get permission. They're going to sue you. That's how they make money off their records, right? Okay, so let's get to the next. All right, so now we have the Bronx 73, okay? You go to the park, it's free. You have these uh, uh, communities of young people listening to hip hop music. The first song in hip hop is 1979 called Rapper's Delight. Hip hop, the hibbit, the hibbit, you remember that one? Rapper's Delight, made over a disco beat, okay? When that song came on the radio, many early hip hop folks were mad. They never heard of the group before because they didn't come up through the Bronx, right? Where they didn't perform in these parks. What happened was a woman named Sylvia Robinson, who was in the industry, created Sugar Hill Records, went to a party and said, wow, who's doing this stuff? Okay, puts this group together. They make a house band. They took the song from uh, Chic and rapped over it. So they were later sued. Then we have Rappers Delight, April of 1979. But from 73 to 79, all this was done in parks and recorded on cassette tapes. Y'all remember cassette tapes? When I show my students, they don't know what a cassette tape is. Ain't that crazy? Never, they don't have any, they don't know about the tapes. You hit the buttons, forget about it. CDs for them are done. It's all digital, everything, all right? But one of the first early DJs, his name is Cool DJ Hurt. He's from Jamaica, came to the States, came to the Bronx, created what's called the merry-go-round. All right, so one of the first hip hop DJs. Wasn't as sophisticated technically as Grandmaster Flash, but nevertheless, he carried these big speakers, had his group called the Herculoids, and here are some of the early flyers. As you can see, the Herculoids, DJ Cool, DJ cool Herc, Clark Kent, Girls Getting Free. That's, that hasn't changed any. They still getting free before 11, right? Here's another one, Skating Palace. So a lot of these early uh, perf uh, perf performances were high school gyms, skating rinks, okay? Because people could start making money, right? Because again, there's a disco scene in Manhattan where if you're 13, 14, 15, you can't get in, and plus you gotta wear a suit. In this scene, sneakers, jeans are required and they're cheaper to get in, okay? So here we have Disco King Mario, Grand Wizard Theater, the Grand Wizard Theater or DJ, Cool DJ AJ, Busy B Starsky, that's a rapper, DJ Hollywood, he's a DJ, okay? So all these folks are gonna perform, and you pay, I think it looks like $6, that's March 1981. Then we have Curtis Blow. Curtis Blow did a song called The Breaks back in 1980. Okay, so we can see now people, you have people making flyers, you have other young people making a few dollars. This is slowly becoming some sort of industry. But again, many people thought it was a fad that'll die out in a couple of weeks. But as I said before, 50, hip hop is 50 years old in August. So it didn't die out, it made more money. It's a billion dollar global industry, right? Think about it. When you say terms like 24-7, you know that term 24-7? That comes out of hip-hop. 
When you say chill, that comes out of hip hop. When you say I give a shout out, that comes out of hip hop. So it's not going anywhere, okay? Now again, I understand we'll get to in the Q and A. Well, Dave, what about the violence? We're gonna get to that. I'm just giving you the context. So early on, hip hop artists were talking about parties, you know, having a good time. There's nothing about deep political messages. So if you go to the Bronx, you talk to these older heads, they like to tell you that because they want to critique the young people. But in reality, it was all about partying, having a good time. Until the song, you heard of it, The Message by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five in 1982. Now, when they made that song, they were skeptical. Why? We can't make money off a message song. But that song did blow up, did do real well. Then what happens? Other artists start making songs in the album with messages. That's how capitalism works, does it? Right? That's how we commodify stuff. It starts on the fringe. Oh, it's not going to make any money. Then once it starts making money, then you go imitate that, that what they've done. But prior to 1982, from 79, the first rap out song, to 82, it was all about partying, period. Happy birthday, skating rinks, feeling good, how many cars can you buy? No one's talking about poverty, unemployment, sexism, nobody, until the message. Then once the message takes off, then we see other groups saying, we can create songs with a message because we can make money from it. That's how capital works. That's how the music industry works. Do the next slide. Next, we have African Mbada. Now, he's important because he puts a socially conscious message in early hip hop. He was part of a group called the Black Spades, a gang member, okay? And he's also a graffiti writer. Many folks started as graffiti writers before they became DJs. His parents were from the West Indies. So therefore, he had a very, he says, an eclectic musical taste in his household, right? Black music, rock and roll, reggae, Afro beats, you name it. He'd listen to that growing up. He takes a trip as a, young, as a young man, goes to the continent, and he's influenced by the movie Zulu, right? Uh, the South African warrior, the Zulu nation. Comes back to the States and creates a group called the Universal Zulu Nation. Okay, in other words, instead of using violence to solve issues, let's use hip hop to create some sort of peace and unity in the community. Bambada was influenced by Malcolm X, black nationalists of the late 60s, early 70s. So he brings some sort of what he calls knowledge, the fifth element, knowledge, right? Let's use hip hop, let's move away from gang violence, killing one another, let's battle whether it's graffiti, MCing, DJing, and let's stop doing all the violent stuff. The Universal Zulu Nation is still around today, okay? So they, what do they talk about? I don't know what talk about all the time, but they ain't killing one another, so I'll take it, right? So again, he brings this consciousness, the Universal Zulu Nation. So in the Zulu Nation, you have many B-boys, B-girls, the graffiti artists becoming part of this organization. So again, he brings in a consciousness to hip hop music and culture, which is very important. Next slide. Now here we have an image of the Bronx, and we'll get the flash in a minute, okay? So these are all the locations where you're gonna find the different deeds. So right here is Bambada, that's his part of the Bronx. Grandmaster Flash is here, and then Cool Herc is up here in the West Bronx. These are the different parks. Parks here, Ex 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 Ecstasy Garage, the Disco Fever, Plaza Tunnel, these are where they would have hip hop parties, okay, all up in the Bronx. Westchester Police Athletic League, okay? That's why we call this the Bronx Origins of Hip Hop. So all from 73, 79, 81, 82, all this is going on in the Bronx. All uptown, all young people, there's no record contracts yet, okay? There's no million dollar stars, but these are the called ghetto superstars. Because in these neighborhoods, Flash was a star. Bimbada was a star. Herc was a star. Okay, all uptown in the Bronx. Now, where I grew up, I grew up in the north, I'm way up here. Okay, northeast section of the Bronx. Okay, but again, we talk about Fort Apache. We talk about those images of the Bronx all down here, the notorious, the South Bronx. 
But again, as a function of what? Deindustrialization, concentrated poverty, right? Higher crime rates all existed in these areas. So next we have Grandmaster Flash. We talked about it earlier. Quick mix theory, okay? Here's Disco Fever. Okay, so this was a club owned by an Italian guy whose dad owned a club in Manhattan. Starts this club in the Bronx, but this thing called hip hop, right? So one night he invites the young people in, charge them like a dollar to get in. The place is packed. Now Disco Fever becomes a, a location for hip hop parties because why? You can make money, right? You can commodify it. There's an audience, there's a demand, and therefore he took advantage of that. But like everything else, over time, the hip hop scene shifts to Manhattan, this club goes out of business. Like most clubs, right? Clubs are very hard thing to maintain. It's like, uh, you heard of Studio 54, right? That's big in the 70s, and then they just went out of business once disco died out, okay? So the fever from like the early 80s to the mid 80s was the, one of the early places to go for hip hop music and culture. Now, unfortunately, part of this, this environment too is violence. But this is just particular to black people, black men and boys, right? We know whenever young guys get together, throw some alcohol involved, you've been to UF football game, so guys act crazy. I don't care what color you are, right? You get some drink, a lot of young guys, a lot of energy, there's going to be some problems, right? It's just how men are socialized, right? So, so part of these, issue, these problems, there might be some issues of violence. Again, young, young guy, older guys like to deny that history. But the reality is there are people that's going to take advantage of people, right? They call them stick-up kids, right? Take your five dollars, might rob you, things of that nature. Unfortunately, that's part of it. Not all of it, but that's part of it. But the same thing you'll see later in the 80s with you go to like uh, hip-hop concerts. There's violence in hip-hop, but you go to rock and roll concerts, Ozzy Osbourne, right? When you have large crowds of people, there's going to be challenges. Unfortunately, when African-Americans have these issues, it becomes a whole big national problem because we think black people are more prone to crime than anybody else. Like, black people love crime. It's not true. Nobody likes crime. Crime stinks. But that always seems to be the assumption when we talk about hip-hop. All right? So we have Flash right here, plays at the fever, break beats. Okay? Next slide. Now, we also find there's DJs in Brooklyn, Queens, and Harlem, but they're not Bronx DJs, okay? So in Brooklyn, we have Grandmaster Flowers. So what they do is they have parties in the beach. They have parties where they play the full song. That's not hip-hop. Remember, they're taking segments of songs and repeating that segment over and over again. That's an uptown Bronx thing. So many folks from Brooklyn and Queens well, we created hip hop. It's not true, right? Because what these folks are doing more of playing the full songs, there's a difference. And that distinction gives Bronx the hip hop origins. Now, again, these folks will debate you and argue all day, but they're wrong. That's no doubt about it. They're wrong, right? Of course, I'm from the Bronx, right? <laughs> I'm not objective right now, right? <laughs> all right? Queens, you have new sounds, disco twins. Okay, so they would hold huge parties in Brooklyn and Queens, but again, they play the full song, go from one song, mix in the next song. What Flash is doing, we're taking a segment of a song and re-looping that over and over again. Okay, there's a distinction, okay? Next, we also have, well, who created rapping? Rapping over a mic. So there's a gentleman here by DJ Hollywood. You can go play his thing right quick. Yeah, and you know, ASMR. No, 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 no way, man. Yep, no sweat. All right. Yeah, and you know, ASMR. No, 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 no way, man. Get that forward, kid. Oh, man. So this is DJ hey, Hollywood hey, right here. The avenue, everybody feeling good. And one more time, it's me, Hollywood. Get strong, feel it tough. But don't mind that there's only a rough. It's only a rough. We're putting it on tape to let 
Pop right there. Okay, so now he's rapping over a mic. He's a DJ, okay? So in the middle of someone dancing, he might say, put your hands, he might say whatever, some sort of call to get a call and response. I say this, you say that, right? But there's a debate because DJ Hollywood was playing in discos in Manhattan. He wasn't up in the Bronx. And what he figured out was, right, he could do five parties in one night because he's not bringing all this equipment. The DJ booth is already set up. Okay, so the argument is by many older hip hop heads, DJ Hollywood is not part of the hip hop canon. I disagree with that, right? Because he was rapping, right? But because he was in, he was he was a little older and he was in Manhattan, not the Bronx, they don't give him any credit. But nevertheless, he did put hip hop on the map. What made him smart was he was able to commodify quicker. In other words, when you had a flash party, you have to bring all your records and all the equipment. What he figured out was I can play five clubs in one night and make $2,500 because I don't have to bring all those records. I just come in, get on the mic, say a few words, and go to the next party. Say the same thing, go to the next party. But that's DJ Hollywood. Next, we also have DJ Eddie Chiba, another rapping DJ can play his stuff. Now he's rapping over a song called To Be Real. That's a disco song. Okay, that's DJ Eddie Cheaper. Okay, so again, another one who's a DJ in Manhattan. Okay, rapping over the mic. And this goes back to, we showed you Frankie Crocker, the influences of these black DJs. So disco DJs played in clubs like Hotel Diplomat in Manhattan, Small's Paradise in Harlem. That's an older crowd. You have to wear a suit. You know, these are folks that are, you know, trying to become middle class. Hip hop, a younger crowd, sneakers, jeans, and t-shirts. Okay? So there's a distinction. The next slide. Okay. So next we get into race, class, culture, and politics. All right. So again, what's the scene in balance? So again, the hip hop scene, younger. So again, we get identified with hip hop with young people, uh, 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 crime, violence that we associate with black men. Okay. We find the Manhattan scene where you have black people who are becoming bourgeoisie, middle class. Not saying it's a major tension, but it's a reality, okay? We see here, we have Malcolm X, that's we talked about uh, uh, Africa Mimbada. Uh, we see the disco scene, LGBTQ, Steel 54 in Manhattan. We also find out of, out of Memphis, Stax Records, Soul and Funk Music, Soul Train becomes a big uh, a show in 1972, all right? So we see hip hop is a combination of all of this early all of it, all right? We also have Calypso Reggae, Fel, uh, Fela, Fel, uh, Fela from Nigeria. It's part of this hip hop scene, so it's, it's diasporic, all right? We see that. We also find Martin Luther King in terms of integration, Motown. So looking right here is that what Motown, their job was to assimilate. Y'all remember Motown, right? Oh yeah, I remember Motown, right? Top 40 American bandstand. So I think the tension, not the tension, hip hop is on the one hand, you want your separate black cultural aesthetic, but at the same time, you want to be recognized on American bandstand. I mean, that's an ongoing debate we have in 2022, right? So on the one hand, you want to create a separate scene, right, where African Americans acknowledge your existence, but at the same time, you also want to be acknowledged by the Grammy Awards, the Oscars. So there's always that tension that exists, okay? So we find that during the 70s and early 80s, there was a separate black aesthetic 
where black artists were being recognized by black shows and award shows. By the 80s, when we have, remember Michael Jackson thriller, right? Whitney Houston, right? We find in the 80s there are black pop stars. Or some say pop music is watered down black music. And there's a whole nother tent. I think Whitney's Bop, it comes out in December. Okay, we're now by the 80s. I can be recognized on white shows and make even more money. And we see the same thing with hip hop. Hip hop initially was in the category in the Grammys until 1988. And I was upset because Will Smith won. Because there were better rappers, but that's what I realized. It wasn't about the best rapper, it was, it was the rapper who appealed to a wider audience, and that's Will Smith when he won in 1988. And even today, when I watch these award shows, I even told my son one year, there was a white guy named uh, Macklemore versus Kendrick Lamar, and Macklemore beat him in the Grammys Award. I told my son, I'm telling you, son, the fix is in, and I was right. Even Macklemore admitted that Kendrick Lamar is a better MC, but it's not about the best MC with these award shows. But at the same time, you want to be recognized. So you find that Bandstand would now in the 70s get rap acts, Run DMC and many others, because why? It's a commodity. It makes money. But early on, it was all a black scene, local clubs, skating rinks. But then by the 80s, and by 1984, 85, 86, now hip-hop's a national, international, billion-dollar industry. Okay? Now, here's a little, I was going to tell you a little death of disco. This is a great, uh, great little clip. Um, so, man, so in 19... Disco sucks! <laughs> disco sucks! Disco sucks! July 12th, 1979. All right, so disco, as we know, Studio 54, very uh, dance, dance oriented music, very inclusive. So many people say a lot of straight white males hated disco because they couldn't dance, hated disco, right? So but nevertheless, by the late 70s, here's a white DJ in Chicago that's rock stations getting replaced by disco. So he's pissed off. He's angry. So he decides to have a disco sucks uh, uh, movement at the Chicago Comiskey Park. Now, the 79, the White Sox are terrible. They're drawing like 10,000 fans a game. They stink. So he has a big event here. Now, the thing about why I show in this video is because many early hip-hop songs rapped over disco beats. So it's like hip-hop used disco early on. But by this event, 79, this marked the end of disco. We could play this. Keep hard. The White Sox versus the Tigers. Between games, 24-year-old Steve Dahl, a popular disc jockey for Chicago rock station Loop 98, would take the field at the head of his so-called anti-disco army to blow up thousands of disco records. Every day I would play a disco record and drag the needle across it, you know, and scratch it and then blow it up. But I tapped into something. There's a, an undercurrent of hatred for disco. In a few minutes, we're going to attempt the world's largest disco demolition. Admission that night was less than a dollar. <laughs> if you also contributed an album. We have people come, uh, 98 cents, you get in, bring a disco record, boom. Unusual promotions were nothing new at Comiskey in the late 1970s. White Sox owner Bill Veck, one of the few owners in Shrine in Cooperstown, was baseball's P.T. Barnum. It was Veck who commissioned Comiskey's exploding scoreboard. It was Veck who in 1951 sent Eddie Goodell to the plate. By 1979, his son Mike was running the White Sox promotions department. He's like, what is this disco demolition? I said, we're just going to blow up some disco records and there's a guy in town who's red hot and... It'll draw some people. He was like, I really did think you know, this is going to be embarrassing. At most, there will be 5,000 people that will show up for this thing, and I'm going to look like an idiot. He was worried that even if we doubled their attendance, take it to 12,000, they <coughs> still don't look empty. <laughs> Little did we know. This is now officially the world's largest anti disco rally. 
there's throngs of people coming. There's throngs, and they're all carrying albums. The late Bill Beck told me Sox Park had 70,000. First time Satchel Page pitched. There had to be 70,000 people in that ballpark. I don't know how they got in. You could see people coming through the portholes out in left field. There was holes cut out in the wall, and people were coming up through the holes. People were swiping pops out of my tray, and there wasn't anything you could do about it. You couldn't move. You couldn't go chase someone because you couldn't get anywhere. It seemed like there was kegs in every aisle of the ballpark at night, you know, because everybody was drunk. I said, you ought to have the pot concession. But what I just smelled down there, I think there must be a master load of pot here in this ballpark. Well, listen, we took all the disco records that you brought tonight. We got them in a giant box. And we're going to blow them up real good. They were supposed to just put them into a bin for Steve Dahl to blow up, but... Uh... Obviously, people brought more than one. Even before the game started, people were flinging records all over the place. The first disc that was thrown missed me by a couple of inches. It missed the right side of my head by a couple of inches. It was a real dangerous situation. I mean, I couldn't understand why they didn't delay the game. They're going, Rusty, Disco, you know, socks and be real loud, and we're going to kill Disco today. Disco is dead, you know, and that. And I'm going, no, I was just in this contact last night. How are you going to achieve that, right? The Tigers won game one 4-1. Then it was time for Steve Dahl, the disc jockey, to blow up some records. <laughs> he took to the field in a jeep at the command of his ragged army. His troops greeted him as a conquering hero as he seized the microphone. All these clowns who paid 98 cents to get in the ballpark were going to have their, their moment of glory, and I thought it would happen very rapidly. One, two, three, boom! Yeah! That was up real good! I mean, there was a flash and a stream of bright albums. Like, everybody just was stunned. Center field disappeared. I mean, there was a crater in center field. It was unbelievable. With the crate and its contents in shards on the outfield grass, Dahl enjoyed a victory lap of sorts and left the field. He could not have known that disco demolition was just getting started. As White Sox pitcher Ken Kravick went to the mound to warm up for the second game, a few fans <laughs> abandoned their seats and headed for the field. All of a sudden, you know, one person right on the field and another and another. Left field, right field, box seats. It was almost like a bunch of lemmings. It just was like the floodgates opened up. We saw that there was no security stopping us, and uh, we just said, hey, let's do it. Jimmy Pearsall back at the ballpark, and I'm sure glad, and I hope they don't let you people see what's going on here at Comiskey Park. One of the saddest sights I've ever seen in a ballpark in my life. This garbage of demolishing a record has turned into a fiasco. <laughs> you were outraged. I was. I was just, you know, Major League really Baseball is Major League Baseball. This is a rat race. A bunch of idiots who probably had never gone to a game in their life hurting the game of baseball and hurting baseball in Chicago. The baseball is no longer the story. It's this crowd and the White Sox may have to forfeit the second game. Watching the fans slide down the foul pole was like, oh my God. The field was on fire. You know, it was on fire. I've never seen a baseball field on fire before. To see this happening is a disgrace. It was the worst promotion in the history of the world. This is Bill Beck. Please clear the park or we'll have to call out the game and close the park. I saw people steal home plate, dig up home plate. They dug up home plate. I saw a lot of people running the bases. Having simulated baseball games, which was kind of cool. They were ripping the field apart, kids jumping up and down on the tarp. I'm pretty sure that I saw two people having sex behind third base. Not even Harry Carey, then the White Sox announcer, could control the frenzied crowd. Can you hear me out there? <laughs> Holy cow! <laughs> My friends and I went and sat in the Tigers' dugout. We were passing around the Jack Daniels, and one of the coaches came out and he said, uh, Son, 
give me that bottle. And like, yes, sir. I gave him the bottle, and he goes, now, son, get out of our dugout. After nearly 20 minutes, Carrie and Bill Vec tried again, beseeching those who'd stormed the field to return to their seats. They even broke into song. <laughs> Their efforts were futile, as was the incongruously polite tone of a message on the scoreboard. The fans simply wouldn't surrender the field for the second game. Now the police are out on the field. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> they rode in on their horses, and the kids just ran for the hills. After nearly 40 minutes of mayhem, Comiskey Park's field was pockmarked with divots and debris. You can go out there, you see puddles of wet beer and, and stuff was wasted on the field. There was glass broken out there. It was, it was a mess. With the anti-disco revelers finally off the diamond, the grounds crew attempted to make the field playable. Even as Tigers manager Sparky Anderson argued it would be impossible to play. Dahl's army had demolished disco and in the process, Comiskey's field. The umpire in chief and the president of the league has declared that the playing conditions on the field will not permit them to play the second ball game. The White Sox were forced to forfeit. There were 39 reported arrests, but only minor injuries, among what some say was the largest ever White Sox crowd. <laughs> it was a disastrous evening from, from my standpoint. There are no number of tickets that you could sell that would make it worthwhile. Dad thought I got hustled. He was always of the opinion that the station knew that it was going to be a lot bigger than I had any idea. I always took one great offense more than anything else. Don't blame us. We did a promotion that overworked. You got to give them credit, though. I mean, they did get a big crowd at the ballpark. That's stupid. You're stupid for saying that. I want to say it right now. <laughs> You talk to people in the radio business and they'll tell you that overnight <laughs> stations stop being disco stations. The Bee Gees actually blamed me for killing disco, which I felt was a, a victory for me. I took that as a win. We did a promotion that, that caused a forfeiture. I regret that. As a cultural event, I'm kind of proud of it. Well, there you have it. The end of disco. <laughs> but uh, so we could talk about so before we get a and a so let's talk about so the issues with hip hop that I know we have questions on right just last week a famous hip hop artist named Takeoff was murdered in Houston after playing a dice game why are they still playing dice is the question right and we see that a lot of there's another rapper PNB was shot in LA and killed about two months ago Another rapper two years ago named Pop Smoke was on a beat, break and entering was murdered, you know, and uh, this is this is an issue. Biggie Smalls, we know, was murdered in 97 in Tupac. So we know that there's this side of hip hop that gets this attention of a large issue. Why does this happen? Now, the reality is, is that pe people don't want to die. We know that. Right. But it's somehow with, you know, uh, looking at commodification of black male death. So part of hip hop's issue is. On the one hand, you're telling this story, right? Creating this story of what you see in these neighborhoods, but then how true you are to the story is always this tension. And then for some of these artists, leaving that life behind, like Jay-Z, he's left that behind. He's a billionaire. He's figured it out. Will Smith has figured it out. Ice-T has figured it out. Snoop Dogg has figured it out. Ice Cube. So most of these artists, you know, are married, believe it or not have kids, they're regular, they vote, citizens, human beings, okay? They made the right decision. Unfortunately for many of these younger artists, this whole notion of what they say, keeping it real, right? And I think that becomes the, the tension, right? What does that mean as a black male keeping it real? Have to be some particular way, right? But then as they know, they figured out that that way leads to prison or death. And that's one of the challenges we still see in hip-hop, particularly amongst black male artists, right? These recent killings, and the one that just died, he was 28 years old, out of Atlanta. Had a great career, 
died over a dice game. Ridiculous. It's silly. So hip hop's in this situation. What are we going to do about it? Okay, and that's an ongoing question. But the reality is, is that that's not all of hip hop. That's what you're going to hear on the news, right? That's what draws attention. But there are artists out here who do all this other work. You're just not going to hear about it. So I think that's what you always want to keep in mind. Before you say hip hop's in a crisis, you have to think about that's what's on radio commercial, but there's other hip hop artists that do not get engaged in that stuff. That these are still aberrations, the ones who are murdered and killed. Most are not, okay? Most are living the regular life like a citizen, all right? All right, so all I do is why don't we do some Q&As? I know there'll be some great questions. Don't be scared, say whatever. We'll all have a discord. Oh, I see a hand it right up. Okay, but before we do that, let's thank David for this fantastic presentation. <laughs> or, as, or as the great sports announcer, Harry Carey, would say, holy cow. <laughs> okay, who has a question? Right over there. Oh, you got Don like Oprah right now. <laughs> okay. Why, can you hear me? Um, why is so much of the language foul? and violence i mean it really does i think incite violence so many of the lyrics okay that's the oh i'm loud you turn me down some okay oh i got you right so obviously language is an issue right so does is language incite violence okay now one can argue that i've heard plenty of that language for years i haven't heard a soul in my life right i think again most people are not doing that right i think you look at statistically right most people that attend these concerts are not doing the violence, right? It's individuals. But like you saw there with the Chicago disco thing, right? I mean, when we have large crowds of people, there's going to be individuals who are going to not behave appropriately. But I think what happens when it's African-Americans, the assumption is we just look at the whole group. But now in terms of the violence part, I mean, obviously, I think the other issue is they use adult language, but young people buy hip hop music. But you were a kid once. When your parents told you not to do something, what did you do? You did it. <laughs> right? Don't listen to that. And you listen to it anyway. You know, so I think it's, it's, it's one of those things where the language is not changing. It's unfortunate for some, right? I think uh, it's one of those things where it's up to these artists to make that decision. Man, I'm, just, I'm walking a, 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 a thin line here. But I, hear, I, I think, again, the language and the violence, I think the violence are by individuals. It's not everybody. So we just want to keep that in mind. But it is unfortunate. There's no doubt about it, right? There's no doubt about it. You don't want to be killed being an artist. But I think at the same time, it's not everybody. I think language doesn't cause violence. I think that violence for some individuals, just they're just bad individuals or bad actors. That's how I look at it could agree or disagree, right? It's individual bad actors. But I think violence in itself doesn't, language in itself doesn't cause the violence. It's just individuals who, unfortunately, don't know how to carry themselves, right? Resort to violence. I think that's the issue. Great. Other questions? Is this on? Can you hear? Yeah, you're good. Okay. I, th I think I'm going to disagree with what you're saying. Okay. Because... Our media today homes in on the language and the violence. Mm -hmm. And as a result, this is what the young kids are seeing. Mm -hmm. So then they copycat. Mm -hmm. And that perpetuates more anger, more violence, more crime. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's look at it. If you look at recent uh, the crime data, there's been a decrease, an uptick in crime, right? So prior to hip hop, do we have crime in this culture? Right, so crime is part of any, any nation state, right? So the argument is, if you listen to hip hop, does it make one more violent? Now, all the folks I've grown up with who grew up in hip hop never done jail time, right? So how does that explain people like myself who's listening to stuff I've never done jail time? Most people I know that grew up on this music are law abiding citizens, right? So how do we, you know, how do you explain me? Right? I think you know what? Okay, so now that's a media thing, right? So the argument is, in our media, what causes news is, like you said, crime generates views, right? Crime is an issue that gets us, in other words, we don't, sh 
All right. The number one cause of who knows number one cause of death among African Americans? Anybody know? Number one cause of death. Go. What is it? Heart disease. So why the news doesn't report live from the hospital? Joe Smith died of a heart attack. What gets on the news are homicides, even though more people die of cancer and heart disease, right? So it goes back to your point, right? Our news is made up of what I say aberrations, because in reality, most people die of heart disease and cancer, but that's not newsworthy, is it? Then the question is, it becomes newsworthy, then we'll find out how do we solve the high deaths of heart disease and cancer? But we fo focus on the crime. So which puts more resources in what? Trying to fight crime instead of putting more resources in trying to make people more healthy, right? Heart disease, cancer, we know it's about what? Food deserts, lack of good food. So I think it's two-way street. I think the media, so when I watch the media, I keep in mind that when I see those unfortunate murders, I try to make my mind know those are still aberrations. Most people are not behaving that way. But it's hard when the TV keeps reminding you every day. That's the child's so right. I'm not on the news every day. You're not on the news every day. What's on the news every day are aberrations and anomalies because that's what we call news. So if you go to a hip hop concert, if there's a fight, that's on the news, right? But once everybody behaves, we're not gonna watch that. That's boring. And that becomes the problem with hip hop. So whenever it's reported in the news, they're not gonna show you artists building affordable housing for some black people in Southeast Atlanta. You're gonna see an artist with a gun charge, right? So I try to keep that in mind. So when you do see that, remember it's news, it's commercial news and their job, what's the number one job commercial news? Ratings and to draw advertising money. It's not about educating the populace about other ways of seeing the world. There's no money in that, unfortunately. That's how we view our culture, right? So let's think about it. We watch the news, particularly when it comes to hip hop, what story draws attention? Is it Queen Latifah building housing in Newark? They ain't gonna watch that. Is it T.I. building affordable housing in Bankhead? We're not gonna watch that. However, if T.I. gets a gun charge, we're gonna watch that, or you're gonna know about it. If T.I. is murdered or shot, you're gonna know about that. So I just try to keep that balance when you watch public media. And that's a problem, that's, and it's, a, it's not just hip hop, it's our culture in general. Why is that news, right? Rather than real statistics, heart disease, and heart disease is presentable, right? We need to spend more energy talking about those issues. That's all my point, but that's a good question. Good. What is the connection between the hip hop culture and uh, Black Lives Matter? That's a good question. So I think that's a great question. So obviously, you know, Black Lives Matter started 2013 as a hashtag after Trayvon Martin and Michael Ferguson. So I think again, with Black Lives Matter, I think artists who are politically conscious or uh, uh, activists. So again, those artists, you're not gonna hear about it because they're not on commercial radio. A lot of artists today rely on SoundCloud and they rely on social media to get their message out. So I think for Black Lives Matter, they're open to artists who are progressive, right? So using the B word or sexism, misogyny lyrics would not make you a Black Lives Matter superstar. Okay, so I think artists who are activist driven, who are progressives are part of BLM, but those artists you're not gonna hear on commercial radio. Those artists you're not gonna get on. Here's a local artist from Oakland who's talking about police brutality. Here's a local artist talking about the environment. You're not gonna hear that. Right now, if that local artist robs a liquor store or gets robbed, we'll hear about that. So I think that's the challenge that we face, that for, for this population to hear, what we hear about hip hop is what we see on the news. But there's a whole other segment of artists that doesn't make the news, and that's the problem. So I just want you to keep that in mind. So when you do see that, I remember Dr. Kent saying, this is an anomaly. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be confident enough that most folks are not doing that. Right, that there are artists out there doing some positive things. Okay, and I think that's the message I want to leave here. Not saying let's not discount it, what the violence, that's an issue, but it's not all hip hop is violent. That's the reality. Because if it was, the numbers would be even worse than they are what we see now. But that's how BLM hip hop, right? So artists who are activist minded, who are promoting positive images are with BLM. Are there questions? Back to Ed. One follow-up in terms of education, uh, is your curriculum or part of your curriculum included in our 
educational system, uh, kindergarten to high school to uh, well, college? Yeah, so what, so what you find is in some, um, I work with Connecticut, they have a new African American Latino history course, and they do have a segment like when you get to like the late 60s, 70s, 80s part, hip hop is part of the curriculum, the, you know, near the latter end of the end of the year. But again, teaching young people about, you know, commercial hip hop, how to use the art form in a positive way, right? How to educate them about sexism, homophobia, and these issues that you see with some artists is what's talked about, right? Sometimes you might have students, like in my hip hop class, I have students create rhymes, right? Have them talk about different topics using lyrics which I do in my class every semester. They kind of, they get a kick out of that. These are grown young adults, like little kids. We tell them to make some rhymes. They love that part. But I know in the K through 12, I think teaching students to be critical consumers is what we try to do. You don't have to consume everything. Being a critical consumer, like people now with Elon Musk buying Twitter. A lot of people now leaving Twitter because they don't agree with Elon Musk's views on the First Amendment. That's being a critical consumer. So you do have choices in the United States. So we try to tell our young people, you don't have to listen or buy all the commercial hip hop. There are other alternatives out here. Here's how you locate them. Here how you engage these artists. But it's a challenge because you're dealing with everyone listening to commercial radio. It's hard. Or listening to the top popular songs. How do you educate young people to go against the norm, which is very challenging because, as you know, young people want to fit in. Any other questions from the audience here? We have about 15 online, Ju Julianne. Oh. I don't have any questions online. Okay. okay. Well, David, as I announced earlier, teaches any number of classes at UF. How would you like to have him come back and do another presentation for us? What do you think? I, I set you up. You can't say no, right? Not the uh, next time I'll stay for lunch, too. Okay, great. I'm counting on that. I never turn down and free before food. you go, uh, you know, none of this would work without Julianne, and she is the hip-hop girl today, so. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you.